We know that stars of various types can be plotted on an HR diagram, and depending on certain characteristics like their temperature and luminosity, they can be categorized as either supergiants or main sequence stars or white dwarfs, etc. But what about the stars we were just talking about in the previous video, the stars that have just become stars, these newborn generation of stars, so to speak? How would their evolutionary path appear on the HR diagram? When a GMC begins to collapse and form the Bok globules that will eventually house the protostars and their circumstellar disks, the temperatures of these shrouded protostars continue rising. So when they're finally hot enough and bright enough, they'll hop onto the HR diagram from the right-hand side. Because remember, temperature increases on an HR diagram from the right to the left, and luminosity increases from the bottom to the top. As a protostar contracts, its temperature increases, but with a rise in temperature comes a greater speed in the movement of the gas molecules. So they start moving faster and faster, increasing the internal pressure of that protostar. Gravitational contraction slows down because of this, and that causes the rise in temperature to slow down too. So with the particles having slowed down now, there's not enough thermal energy for this protostar's luminosity to continue brightening, so it starts to dim down. The temperature at this point in time remains relatively constant, which explains the vertical drop in the HR diagram that shows the evolution of these protostars turned pre-main sequence stars. Eventually, the temperature in the core is finally hot enough to kickstart the thermonuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium, at which point this pre-main sequence star is finally considered a star, and it lands on the zero-age main sequence line, or the ZAMS line. This line, usually at the leftmost edge of the main sequence, represents the point of a star's evolution at which the dominant energy production has become thermonuclear fusion rather than the gravitational contraction that used to fuel its luminosity before. The exact path that a star follows in its pre-main sequence evolution depends solely on its mass. All the different mechanisms that determine the shape of these paths have different timescales depending on the mass of the protostar that's evolving into a pre-main sequence star and then into a main sequence star. Stars like our sun have a pretty steep evolutionary path, taking about 5 million years to evolve from protostar to pre-main sequence star to star. Stars that are smaller than the sun, say of mass one half of our own sun, have a pre-main sequence evolutionary path that's more vertical than the evolutionary path of the sun. These smaller stars would take much longer to undergo the process. Larger stars, however, tend to have a slightly less vertical approach to the main sequence. A three solar mass star drops in luminosity while continuing to heat up, but not as much as the sun. And similar patterns can be seen for stars of nine or 15 solar masses. Notice also that the bigger the star, the shorter the amount of time that it takes for that star to become a main sequence star. Because remember, very massive stars burn fast, burn bright, and die young. And for the same reason, they form pretty quickly too. When we look at the pre-main sequence evolutionary tracks of all five of these differently massed stars, there seems to be some sort of a trend where the luminosity drops a little bit as the stars continue to slowly heat up. This portion of the pre-main sequence evolutionary path is called the Hayashi track, named after Japanese astrophysicist Chushiro Hayashi. The other trend worth noting is the tendency of the larger mass stars to practically continue heating up at a steady rate as they approach the main sequence. This horizontal portion of the pre-main sequence evolutionary path is called the Henye track, named after Hungarian-American astronomer Louis Henye. How much time is spent on the Hayashi versus the Henye pre-main sequence evolutionary track depends on the mass of the protostar. And this mass will ultimately determine not only what spectral type main sequence star the star will be, but also how it will eventually evolve and die out. Which brings us to the topic of stellar evolution coming up next.